or I came prepared for a little activity that may or may not address your questions. The activity is, there's no page number for it, but if you look at the, in the tab of your notebook, facilitated conversation and your questions, please. And in the middle of that section, there's a blue divider page. <clears throat> and immediately after that is the page called your questions, please. And the, at the bottom of that is the description of a uh, sort of schedule of what we'll do for the next 45 minutes, actually 40 minutes. <clears throat> the activity consists of a newspaper story that I was reading when it was time for me to come up with an activity. <clears throat> and one of our local retailers uh, conveniently came up with a, with a case. So I just took a newspaper story and reduced it to 17 points that were made in this newspaper story. American is the name of the retail store. So you read the 17 points, you ask the three questions there that are there on the bottom of the first page. Um, I'm, so, so what I want you to do is to sort of pretend like you're a consultant. I didn't say three, I said three questions, I didn't mean that. <clears throat> but record the observations and you might make if you were a consultant to this company and what questions you might share with them. And there's room opposite the 17 points for you to record your comments. Now that's, that's the other activity. The fact that I spent proportionately more time describing it doesn't mean I prefer that activity. You can do it on your own if you want to. <clears throat> so we're going to make a quick decision, though. So, so the choices are first, uh, questions and answers. Second, do the activity. So how many would prefer the first choice, questions and answers? You don't get more voice by waving your hand. <laughs> this is a stir, stir, stir. <clears throat> <laughs> no, 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 no. The, that, the option of going to John's, you choose by w getting up and walking out. The second choice is to do the activity. Okay. No. <laughs> There's probably a Myers-Briggs profile that describes your third option. I, I don't know. People ask me what my Myers-Briggs profile is, and I've done it five or six times. And I say... My profile is the one that can't remember their profile. <clears throat> if they insist on it, I say, okay, I'm an ESPN. <laughs> Which sounds close enough to the real thing. Okay, so let's, uh, the, 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 the first option people won. Damn, I sort of put all that work into this thing. <laughs> but that's, that's fine. This is, <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so now, if nobody, is willing to stand up and ask a question or make a point or a comment, we immediately revert to the second choice. <laughs> it's better, since this is being recorded, and, uh, to just walk up to a microphone and do it. There's one over that side, two in the middle, and none over there. Yes? In the facilitated conversation, um, I posed a, a, a concern of mine to the group um, that I'm going through, and someone's said that you were working right now on a book that had a chapter on uh, uh, process of, of what happens during change and chaos and the, how things bottom out, but eventually they should get better. And, and I think we're going through change and we're kind of down in the bottom right now. And if you could talk some about um, what we might expect or in some of those uh, change transformations. In, in, in the speaker's room, I was sitting there when Barb Lawton was describing that to John Whitney, and I was fascinated by it. I, in the book, I talk. I have a section where I talk about the new management competencies and um, <clears throat> refer to change. Uh, in effect, it's a way of framing, reframing the system of profound knowledge. And part of, seems to me, the knowledge of psychology is to under understand change and people's resistance to change. But what I have talked about is how. Um, there's a sort of classic learning curve which is, it involves um, a, a temporary loss of productivity while you're learning the new method and then a rapid increase that levels off. That's this classic learning curve uh, from organizational science. We could see that, that it never just simply levels off. If, if nothing else happens, it will deteriorate or entropy will set in. That's, so that's the starting point of all this. Um, 
the uh, and what and what Barb Lawton is talking about is how um, entropy doesn't always end in the dissolution of the organization. That in fact, there's some point, if I understood it correctly, uh, and if I know you're going to ask the question, I would have taken notes. That the, the entropy occurs to a certain extent until it forces um, a, a, a new organization, a new entity, which then rises itself, so that there's a built-in, she referred to it as an S-curve of, of change. Now that's, I can't say any more than I just said about that. There's another learning curve that I associate with quality, and maybe this is what you heard reference to, where there's the classic learning curve, rapid increase, but it's an illusion. It's, it's, it's a rapid increase of, of, uh, of phony knowledge, of, it's a false knowledge. It's, it's where people, in, in they're trying to master um, quality, master only the jargon. And they aren't, they aren't changing anything about their relationships, the way they plan, the way they make decisions, the way they organize and conceive of work, the way they respond to problems. Nothing there changes, but, but they can talk about it. external customers, internal customers, rule, the rules of the funnel, the, all of the jargon um, without ever having changed anything they do. And then there's a point in that learning curve where they know enough or something happens to help them realize they don't know anything. And then it drops to the bottom and the real learning curve starts from there. And I for a while was saying, at first I was concluding that this false learning curve was my cynicism at work more than anything else, but then I kept seeing it over and over again. <coughs> and uh, and so I proposed that it wasn't my cynicism, it was uh, something predictable. And I had an opportunity to teach, to lecture one day at Dr. Kano's class at Tokyo Science University, and I gave him this false learning curve theory. And he uh, asked a question. He was there both as interpreter to his students as well as asking profound questions. And he said, uh, this is one of those great moments uh, uh, in my life, <laughs> he raised his hand and he said, Mr. Schultes, you say the false learning curve takes one year. And I said, regretting I had ever said anything, I said, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Kano, I think it takes about a year. And he said, hmm, you must be very smart. <laughs> and I said, what the hell does he mean by that? <laughs> in this situation, there's no way out of it. And so, but then I just waited, he said, I think it takes three years. So that in effect, there's this period of time where people just don't get it. And it takes about three years before they start getting it and the real learning curve takes place. And what that did for me was a, it had a very uh, powerful effect on me. For one thing, it confirmed that what I had been observing, uh, he had observed. And I wasn't sure, I still wasn't sure altogether that it wasn't me, more my cynicism than anything else. But the other thing that, that, um, that was powerful about, about that was that I was observing it in American managers and he was observing it in Japanese managers. And we tend to think that the Japanese have a gland that secretes this stuff. Uh, when, when in fact, uh, they go through the same stupidity, what one, of my, what one of my clients called common cause stupidity. We're all victims of common cause stupidity. And, and Dilbert says it best, we're all morons, it's just those who were more morons rise in the hierarchical ranks. <laughs> Not talking about cynicism. Right? <laughs> it's a long answer to your question, sorry. Yes? Uh, Peter, you talked about the chain reaction. If mm -hmm. you improve your products and processes, you'll reduce cost. My question involves the organizational climate. And I was wondering if you have found, as you work on improving your products and processes, that your climate improves, or do you have to do it in the other direction? I don't think you can do it in the other direction. My, my belief is there's, there's nothing like <clears throat> success to bring about a change in morale. And you could sit there and try to study morale and you'll never get anywhere. So I would much, if people complain about morale or the organizational climate, I just try to figure out some way to help them suspend their judgment and get to work on something. 
And when success starts happening, when they realize they can reduce the error rate or the cycle time or just start tickling customers to death, um, I'm trying to imagine a business that tickles customers. Never mind. That's just, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but then all of a sudden, what they used to attribute to things that are squishy, like environment or culture or those kinds of things, will start disappearing. So much of the thrust and so much of the, of the interventions have been on trying to work on morale yeah. and climate as opposed to trying to improve products and processes. I think it's a I think it's a remnant of the old management system. It's a, the evidence of profound stupidity. That's too too, too harsh. I, I think it's another version of train wreck management. You know, we didn't achieve our purpose. We, we must do something, improve our people's morale or climate or stuff like that. It's not saying let's make better products and do better services and improve the processes by which we do those. Let's look for something ethereal. I think even perhaps worse than that, it's a stage of death. That Elizabeth Cooper Ross wrote the stages of death. And the first stage of death is denial. And then it's uh, anger and then bargaining and um, and then um, something else, <laughs> and then something else. <laughs> if I knew you were going to ask that question, I would have remembered the stages of death. Denial, anger, bargaining. Um, pardon me? Rage is part of anger. It's the last one is acceptance, and then there's this one, this other, it starts with a D. Now I'll be distracted all the time. So I'll have to be distracted by tickling your customers to death in this other stage of death. It doesn't matter. The first stage of death is denial. And I have observed a wide variety of forms of denial. Uh, things like you've all heard, you know, that it won't work in our industry, it won't work with American unions, it won't work under these circumstances. You know, maybe it's okay with them, but not for us. Uh, you know. But another form of denial, I think, is to trivialize it. And I fear that this saying, well, we got to work on the climate, is a way of trivializing, trivializing quality. You want to jump up and ask another question, Mark? <laughs> Oops, somebody beat you to it. Um, in regard to this, I think last year, I think it was Barbara Lawton was talking, she had a diagram of, a, of an iceberg. <clears throat> and, um, and I don't remember the percentages, but I think it was something to the effect of, the, uh, the effort of improvement and, and redesign of processes and products would only get you a small percentage towards transformation, but there were these other uh, much more important things like changing the infrastructure, uh, performance appraisals, merit pay, those kinds of things that would go much farther along in terms of transforming an organization. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's what this lady Is that what was you were referring saying, to in, or not? Well, I was, well, I, the, Barb's question, if I recall, talk, it was, was implying at least the early stages. What do you get started? Do you start working on the climate? Do you start working on the, these other things? And my opinion is you start with the other things. And a lot of the climate will change along with that. But I agree, you're going to start running into things that get in the way. You're going to start running into things that, to word, use a word that I try to avoid, sub-optimize. It's like the word interface. I try to avoid that one too. But, it, but you know, you're going to get as far as you can go with the things that I mentioned just a bit ago. And you'll find out that there are things that reinforce the old style of management, like performance appraisal, like merit pay, those things. Um, they're not exactly, maybe they're climate issues, but I don't see them as that. Here's the way I look at it. You're going to have a certain number of problems in your organization. Why do you have those problems? I think they are the direct result of a certain set of interventions, performance appraisal, merit pay, those things. The problems are poor morale, turnover, and those other things. You can make improvements and help people start feeling better and more proud of their work, but you won't get rid of those other problems, and you have to get to them eventually. Now, why do we have programs like performance appraisal, merit pay, reward programs, those things? <clears throat> I think the reason we have those are because of some faulty premises that managers keep in mind. They're sort of the new version of Theory X. 
If managers believe that they can motivate people, then they will do things in an attempt to motivate people. That's a false premise. If managers believe that people are withholding a certain amount of work, waiting for it to be bribed out of them, then they will do things like merit pay programs, um, incentive pay programs, <clears throat> to bribe more work out of people who are obviously holding back. I mean, nobody would say out loud that premise, but that's another false premise. If people believe that you can improve your organization one individual at a time, and, and you can improve the organization by holding individuals accountable for measurable goals, then you'll build an organization around that premise. It's a false premise, and, and so forth. Um, and if they believe it's a manager's job to motivate and control people, you'll build it. So there's a bunch of false premises. As long as those false premises remain in place, then you'll have such programs as performance appraisal, merit pay, et cetera, et cetera. And as long as that, those exist, you'll have such things as demoralization and turnover, high turnover, and problems such as that. Dissemblance as well. I mean, people, people fudging reality in order to look better. <clears throat> Let me, let me, um, you can sit down. <laughs> I just, uh, you've got me started. My son came home from work. This is just this past week. <laughs> he works for a moving company. <clears throat> and he's on a three person crew on a truck. And the manager pulled over, for God's sake, don't sell this to anybody who owns a moving company in Madison. My son will probably get fired. He said, uh, We got a systems problem at work. And I said, Oh, what's going on, Ben? He said, Well, <clears throat> the owner of the company came and told us that profits aren't large enough. I said, yeah. He said, so what he's doing in order to increase profits is he's removing one piece of equipment from each truck. We used to have two dollies, now we've got one dolly. He said, why is he doing that? He said, well, because that'll slow down the job. We charge by the hour. He'll make more profits. <clears throat> this is a true story. I, I seldom have to make up stories because I get enough true ones, <laughs> even from my own family. It's not a fable. Russell Acuff says a fable is a story that either is true or should be true, but this one is true. So that, you know, and it's now, now, in an attempt to try to gerrymander the bottom line, he's creating an even more cynical workforce than he had before. My son and his crew's response was to steal another dolly. <clears throat> from someplace where they weren't being used so that they could good, do good service for their customers. Three-man crew only needs two dollies. And when they finished their work, their work at the end of the day, they took their dolly and hid it someplace. <laughs> they were more dedicated to serving the customer than the owner of the company. But, the, but, but what it's, it's a reinforcement of what I said before, is this system of profound problems, I call it. It's, it's, it's when you have certain premises, and when you act on those false premises, you create policies which create demoralization in the workforce. So in answer to your, your larger question of climate and how do you approach those things, one would hope that over, let's say in this moving company, one would hope that they learn how to improve things, make things more efficient maybe be able to get the work done so quickly that they'll increase business, not have to fool around with the bottom line, have a, an enthusiastic workforce <clears throat> that'll help become some of your best sales people and, um, and increase the business that way. But what the effect that this one single policy having is to move things in the opposite direction. And, and it's why I would start with them talking about, let's talk to the customers and get some data and some feedback. I said, I asked my son, how come he doesn't just raise his prices? And he said, well, his, his slogan is, we're the cheapest movers in town. <laughs> I said, well, if he's the cheapest movers in town, how does he justify increasing the number of hours it takes to do a job? He said, I don't know, I don't know, I'm just telling you what I heard. <laughs> it's, not the, it's only the cheapest if you look at the hourly rate. <laughs> 